most blessed, most glorious. Come on, sing it again from your heart. Most blessed, most glorious. Thank you, Jesus. Kindly turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 127. The reason why the hymn still has retained its power and glory is that they were written from a prayer and a deep theological point of view. And Anytime we are doing the hymns, I would want to plead with, with, with my team that you take it very, very carefully for me. Yeah, the overhead team. Psalm 127, verses 3 through to 5. Let's hear the word of God. Behold, Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Amen. Shall we pray? Precious Father, we honor you for this afternoon. We bless you that there is no God likened unto thee. Thank you for your word, which is life. Ancient of days, the invisible, immortal, wise God. This afternoon, we are gathered in your presence. We honor you that your word is life. Thank you for fresh manna. Feed us afresh today. In this perverted, wicked, and degenerated times, Father, I pray that our family shall stand in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people shall say, Amen. Amen. I want to continue from last week. Last week, we began looking at how you and I can strengthen our family, strengthening your family. And we discovered that no nation will rise above the strength of its family. And the enemy's aim and plan is to destroy the divine order for the family. God's divine order for the family is the husband's headship, the wife's submission, and children's obedience. And the enemy knows very well that for any nation to thrive, the families must be strong. So what the enemy does is to attack the very fabric of divine order. But I pray that in the midst of all these challenges, our families shall stand in the name of Jesus. A truth every parent understands and has discovered is that when the children come out and the midwife or the doctor says it's a boy or, or a girl, what does not follow is an instruction manual. As to how we will bring up our children to uh, make them become champion children will depend on how you and I follow the precepts of scripture and also live a life that will influence our children. Amen. We began last week by saying that to strengthen and to build a healthy family, the first thing you must do is that you must recognize that your child is a gift from God. Verse 3 of 100, 
Psalm 127 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. You see, with that understanding, you will not see your child as ordinary. You will receive that child as a gift that has come from God. Therefore, the struggle and the pain at times the child brings will be worthwhile because you see your child as a perfect gift that has come from above. Amen. Understand that God will never give you a criminal. God will never give you anything that is evil. It is not in his nature to do evil. All good and all perfect gifts come from above. The, sad thing, the question then is that, Pastor, then how come that we have so many criminals in our world? Many of them become criminals in our hands, but not from God. They become criminals in our hands because we do not pay that price enough to train and to bring those children up in the stature and in the fear of God. The second thing we discovered last week, I'm going through, for those of you who were unable to, to be here last week, I would highly recommend that you get a CD. The second thing we discovered last week was that love your child un unconditionally. It is said that mothers who complain and nag about their pregnancy most of the time bring forth to unhappy children. You and I must deal with our children as God deals with us. That is with patience, with unconditional love, and with much grace. We should not love our children because they are A stars. We should not love our children because they are more clever. We should not love our children because they are better, but we should love our children because they are gifts that God has given to us. And I was sharing last week that if I buy you a gift and you complain about that gift, it is not a gift that you are condemning. You are condemning Pastor Kingsley. Say, I buy you an iPad which doesn't work. And yeah, you look at it, look, 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 look at what he has bought for me. When you complain like that, you don't complain about the iPad because the iPad is innocent. The one who brought you that iPad is Pastor Kingsley. So when you complain, you complain about Pastor Kingsley. And at times, when our children become stubborn, instead of loving them, when we complain and complain and our complaint gets out of order, we are actually blaming God. Hey, Pastor Kingsley. Number three, we said last week, have time for your family. Have time for your children. L let me digress a little bit and say this. Uh, it is said that the average woman uses 25,000, and in the extreme cases, very, very extreme cases, 250,000 words in a day. And it is said that with men, their average on the whole, it's about 35,000 words a day, the average. And you know some men who are quite like Pastor Kingsley, they use less than 19,000 words a day. And say you are a CEO, so you chair board meetings, you go to work, and uh, you are giving all this order around, you are... You are looking at reports. They are reporting to you. And say your words are 39,000. So at work, you use, say, 25,000 words. How many is left? 14,000. And you come home. Your, your wife is a housewife. She's been in the house. All what she's been doing, cleaning, preparing your dinner for you. And let's say the average of your wife is 50,000 words per day. So you are left with only 14,000, so you come home. How were you, dear? How was your day? And a phone call comes in, probably from work, and if you are not careful, another one hour. You recline into your resting chair. You watch some telly. You, have, you take in your dinner. You go to the bedroom. You hit the bed. You are gone. Your wife in the day, out of the 50,000 words, has used less than 5,000 talking to the tables and the food she's cooking. That's all. 
and she has 45,000 words, that must come out. You, you are tired. So he, she gives you a nudge. Are you awake? Ah, you are gone. Understand that 45,000 words has been saved. So the next day plus 50, 95. So if you come back with the same attitude, it is 50 plus 45 plus another 45. Then one day, when she can no longer contain it, boom, she explodes and rattles and rattles and rattles. Ah, leave me alone, leave me alone. You talk too much. No, it's your fault. And we must understand that when it comes to bringing up our children to become champion children, the role that mothers play are so significant that we just can't ignore that. And when it comes to communication, we the men, we must understand that if there is anything our wives can handle, it is a lack of communication. Talk to higher. She is too... Imp Let me look at your wife. Look at the queen God has given to you. Just look at her and begin to address her from the depths of your heart, from the crowns of the head to the soles of your feet. Of your feet. And let her know that of a reality she is a queen. Can I have an email from the sisters? Glory to God. Amen. But the truth is that many of the men just have no time. You see, many men have to talk you have to see somebody for instruction. According to the United Kingdom statistics, it is said that the average busy working mother spends only 81 minutes a day with a child. And this includes child feeding. And for the men, the average is 43. And there are some men, they come home so late, they don't even see their children. I pray that minus TBC in the name of Jesus. One little child sell to a child psychologist. The psychologist asks a child, what do you want from your parents next year? So, oh, uncle, oh, what I need from mom and dad is that they will have time for me next year. I don't need any gift. If there is any gift they can give to me, it's their time. Beloved, understand that nothing can take away or replace the time that as parents we give to our children. You know, a friend of mine, Lord Hastings, uh, in, in the House of Laws, one of the busiest laws in our nation, when we met her, uh, I think somewhere last year at the House of Laws, said that ever since my children started growing up, I have never missed a parent evening. Do you know? And let me say this again. That your child can be in the same class with your neighbor's child. They play together. They are good friends. But at the end of the day, they may not write the same exams. They are not being taught the same things. They will be in the same class. One will be uh, uh, in foundation. Another can be in the inter in, uh, intermediate Whereas the best group is the higher. And you must ask yourself, if you don't go to the parent evening, how will you, how can you understand? How is your child being prepared? And you must question the teacher. What are the targets for my child? If I go to parent evening, the first thing I want to see are the targets for my daughters. What are their targets? And if you've put there a C, I want to understand why that child has been targeted for a C. And you will discover that when they are targeted for C, they are in the intermediate class. I remember we had to take one teacher on. Till he changed it. And our daughter did so well. If we had not gone to the parents even to see the targets they had given to her, all, no matter how she would have done in that exam, the best you would have got was a C. And if we don't have time and we are so busy, understand that 
Tell somebody it is well. Say like you mean it. Amen. A statistic that was made, it was said that in terms of child abuse, it was said that 46% of child abuse was about child neglect, 25% was about physical abuse, and 15% was about sexual abuse. May we have time for our children. Then number four, last week we said teach your children. If we don't teach our children, society will teach them, their peers will teach them, TV will teach them, and gang groups will teach them. We must teach our children how to know right from wrong. And this is when the absolutes of scripture comes in. Even in the choosing of their friends, we, must, we can't choose their friends for them, but we can direct them how to make the right choices. They, they must choose friends who share the same values with them. When it comes to uh, uh, sleepovers, uh, you know, and now, I've come to realize that when they, let them cry. When they cry, they will stop crying. Yes. Yes. And you must know that <laughs> when it comes to sleepover, if you don't drive that child, how can that child go and sleep over? It's your right, you are the parent. You must ask your, yourself the very simple question. What spirit is in that house? What are the values in that house? What do they believe in that house? What, who, what God rules in that house? What are they sleeping on in that house? Don't just bundle your child in a car because you won't tie and ship that child away. Number four, our motives, we said last week, for having children must be right. Don't just say you want a child because you want somebody to love you. Don't say you want a child because every, that will help everybody to know you are a man. It is not a cure for loneliness or unhappiness. And don't have a child because you want to get a cancer flat because mom talks too much. And dad yells too much. African daddy. Always yelling. So I will have a child and move away from home. Please don't cheap in yourself. Amen. Then, number five, we said that don't refuse a dad's participation. I always give honor to the Lord for uh, mothers who, because of those who were irresponsible, have had to single-handedly bring up their children. And you will find out that most of those mothers always bring up champion children. But where a mother deliberately, because of the pain and the hurts that led to the breakup of the family, refuses to allow a dad to participate in the bringing up of the, that child, statistics has proven that most of those children grow up underperforming or at times becoming deviants in society. The three most important blessings that every child needs, one, the blessing of God, two, the blessing of a dad, and the blessing of a spiritual mom or dad. So important and we should never neglect that in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Let me continue from number seven. Don't give your child all that he or she needs. Don't avoid indulgence. Giving your kids whatever they want push, pushes them to become morally and uh, philosophically aimless as well as when it comes to behavior and emotionally, they get out of control. Listen to this girl's testimony again. This young lady says, the number one worst thing my parents, more also my mom, she says, this is a true story, did that caused me difficulty was never let me feel anything but happy. Everything I did, as far as my mom was concerned, was perfect. I was never disciplined, never spanked, never told no, 
never grounded, never made to do my homework. There were always excuses for me and blame was placed elsewhere. I lived with unrealistic expectations and perceptions of who I was. I eventually became very angry to the point of violence, says Jacqueline. You see, we have to be careful else our children will become something else. If you spare the rod and try to save the child, you only prepare your child for disaster. But discipline must always be in love. I have never had to hit my girls, but I have always had good conversations with them. And I believe that there are so many ways of child discipline. And one of the best ways to discipline a child is to sit that child down, talk to that child, and open the eyes of that child to the consequences of what he or she is doing. Is somebody with me? Hallelujah. The Texas Houston Police Department wrote down 12 rules that you and I must avoid so that we don't raise juvenile delinquent children. And they, listen to what they said. One, they said, don't give your child everything they want. Else, the child will grow up to believe that the world owes them a living. And they will have a chip on their shoulder. If you give a child everything, you don't love that child. Can you imagine if God, anything, you go on your knees, Lord, I want this. Lord, I want the latest 4 by 4 Lord, I want the latest, uh, uh, what is the best message? Yeah. Lord, anything you ask for, God gives them to you. You will not be a serious Christian. But God supplies us with all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ. Listen, there's a difference between needs and wants. Most of the time, our wants are lustful. We want this because that person has that. But because God loves you, he will not give you what will destroy you. I'm telling you, when I got converted in 77, there was a gentleman who had just learned and had passed us as a tailor. And he wanted a sewing machine. So he brought his request to the church. Grace Baptist Church. We prayed for this young man. You know what? People came together. They bought him three machines. Guess what happened? He backslid it. Three machines. Three sewing machines. That was it. He stopped serving Christ. Hmm. And I'm telling you, there are some people, if they become millionaires, like Richard Branson, oh, you won't see them again. Don't give your child everything they want. Number two, they said, when he picks bad, bad words, rebuke them. If you don't, your child, listen, else he will grow thinking it is cute. And the child will embarrass you before people. If your child uses wrong words at home and you don't correct the child, oh, when your friends come or you go out and you are in the presence of... The child will embarrass you because, and if you rebuke that child, that child will stare at you and say, what kind of daddy is this? If I'm at home, it is correct. But when your friends are around, my words are wrong. If you tell them in the presence of your friends, don't say that. You, when you come, the child will question, the child will question, ah, but daddy, why? And what they say is that the moment they start picking back, and the truth about children, nobody teaches them bad words. It is the sinful nature of man. So the moment that thing starts to surface, you must rebuke the child and tell them, Johnny, you never say that. <laughs> Number three, spiritual training must be from infancy when they are young. Don't wait till your child is 21 and, tell that, and say that the child will decide for him or herself. It will be too late. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that that child should go. And when that child grows up, he or she will not depart from it. Number four, let the child know where he is strong. As he will develop a complex that will make him think society is against him. If he is arrested by the police for stealing, if he is arrested, 
by the police for stealing or doing something wrong. If, you don't co if we don't correct our child at home when they do that, I mean, you are in the room with the child alone, you left 20 pounds. Within 10 minutes, you came back, the 20 pounds is not there. Then you, who has stolen my money? This is not who has stolen my money. Either you have misplaced the money, or you say, hey, my friend, bring the money. It's as simple as that. You know? And, and I, I, we must all thank God, you know, for the children that he has given us. And, and I, I, I honor the Lord. You see, in my home, nothing goes missing. It doesn't matter what you love, you come back and, and see it there. But it is not the same everywhere. <laughs> hey, Pastor, hey, I'm here. I, I, I left 20 pounds here. I, have I said, so you are in the Who and who has been in the house? It's only me and him. <laughs> ah, and you are complaining. Ask him for your money. So when you left the money, where did you go? I only went to the kitchen. Eh? And you didn't take the money. You sure you didn't take the money? What do you know? And when you came back, the money was not there. And you were screaming, telling the whole world your money is missing. Tell the child, oh God, bring the money now. <laughs> Five. Let the children pick things they leave lying around when they are old enough. You know what? That one, whether you like it or not. If you are bringing forth, if you have children, and when they start becoming teenagers, all the missing forks, all the missing spoons, the cups. Oh, parents, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. You, you don't have teenagers. It is in their rooms. When they are young, it's a different thing. But when they grow up, you must go with them Oh, God, you don't pick it up now. Back to the kitchen. And we must help our children to do that. But most importantly, number five, check. Number six, check what your children read. Don't let your children feed their mind on garbage. Understand that these days, your child can access the internet on their phone. They can access it on their iPad. And when they have a laptop, which is fast, it's a different, it's a different ball game. So as a parent, occasionally you must take their iPads, and, and most of the time they put passwords on them. So you must be smart. Oh, can I just check something on your iPad? Can, can you get that for me? By the time you come, I'll show you how to go into the hard disk of, of an iPad and see every site they have visited. You must know, especially those of you who have boys. And don't take anything for, don't suspect your child, but make sure you are giving that child that spiritual oversight. Amen. Check what your child reads and what they watch and what they, the kind of music they listen to. If they are listening to all these guy, kinds of janga and wanga wanga music. <laughs> Do you? Janga Janga music. You know Janga Janga music? You know, every music has a coded message. And because many of these guys belong to the Illuminati, the reverse of the songs they sing glorifies the devil. You know, in the days when... Uh, um, Music was basically on uh, record. When, when you play them back, you hear a message. And it is even said that on the CDs, there is a way. We are arranging to bring one of those guys here, uh, uh, one of those experts who have sat down and have been able to decode the messages that are behind many of this rap and these. I don't want to mention a name. I'm not ready for, I'm not ready to be sued. As I would have mentioned names. And because this is on the internet, I can't do that. 
Many of them have said it has a coded message. Glorifying the devil and immorality. And, and at times you are talking to your children, all their ears are blocked. And then, bam, bam. They are standing there, bam, bam. Take one of that and put it in your own ear. You will hear sound. But number seven, the Texas Police Department says, uh, Houston Police Department says, don't quarrel in the presence of your children. It is, it is immature and it is dangerous. Don't say this will prevent them from shock when, they, when the marriage breaks up. Why should your marriage break up in the first place anyway? When you do that, you prepare them to believe that it is the best way to live as a couple who has the best harsh words. The words that comes out of our mouth who our spouses must encourage and must be words of blessing, but not words of condemnation. Number eight, help your child to learn how to earn some money during their holidays and help the child to manage the money. Hmm. You know, our children, when they get job, they won't give their money to you. No. They don't pay rent. They don't pay rent. But what you as a parent must do is to encourage your child to invest that money. And at that tender age when they start earning money, be there for them as a support for them to invest it in something. I, I don't think it's fair when our children work and we take the money from them. It's not fair. But what we should do is that we should not just allow them to be using all their money on shoes and earrings. They just buy. They just buy. 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 But we must encourage them to invest that money wisely for their own future. And also, encourage them that now that you've got a job, whatever you are able to buy for the home, buy it. And at times, it's just toothpaste. You know, supplying toothpaste for the whole family every month. At times, it's, it's, it's a dishwashing soap and the shower gel. That's all. And the other gels for the body. When you do that, you are helping your child. And you see that you will always find out that there are some children, they are naturally self-motivated. They pick after their daddies, they pick after their moms. But there are others you have to teach them. Else, they will take the money. They, 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 it's not party day, but they give the money out. You know? Tell your neighbor, mercy. And they, they, they work and they'll come back to you for money. They don't pay rent. They don't contribute to anything. They will come back for money. But number eight. Number nine. Don't side with your child. Don't side with your child or take his part against the neighbors, the teachers, and the police. May, unfortunately, many, many parents do not know their children. And as such, when the teachers complain, when the police department is after them, and when the neighbors are complaining, they put on their jeans, especially mothers, and they are ready for a fight, man. And I'm telling you, every mother will fight for their child. But the truth is that, mommy, you don't know your child. You see, think about it carefully. Do you think that your, no, your neighbor and the police and, you, and your child's teacher, because of your child had a meeting and ganged up against your child? So if all of them are saying the same thing, listen to the other side of the story. And sit your child down and find out exactly what is happening. But if you have that rapport with that child, if you have that relationship with that child, that child will open up to you. Ah, mommy, not me, oh, not me. Ah, mommy, oh, say, man, yeah, man. Hey. It doesn't matter how they walk, they will be champion children in the name of Jesus. Mm. If you don't do that, the police department says you will have to prepare for a life of grief. But you will prepare for a life of joy in the name of Jesus. 
Number eight, what to do to strengthen your child and the family. Admit before your children when you are wrong. You see, let your children know you are human and as such you make mistakes. It is not, it is not wrong at all to say sorry to your child. It does not take away your office as a parent. It does not take away the authority that you have as a guardian. It does not affect it anyway. You see, for you, if saying sorry to a child may come to you as a shock, but the truth is that your child already knows you are not perfect and that you make mistakes. Our children know when we make mistakes, just that they dare not say it. But when we blow it, they know, they know that as for this, mm, they know. And it, it only makes the family stronger. It strengthens the family. When you make a mistake, you say, Davina, I'm so sorry. But you know me and you, we are friends, so don't worry. It doesn't matter their age. It is not wrong to say sorry to your child. Amen. You see, the London riots of 2011... Uh, for many of us as parents and adults in this country, perhaps was the biggest shock in our times of living in this country. To see young people rebel, loot shops, burn shops, attack innocent people, and literally our children went wild. This happened because many, many fathers lost their roles as the prophets, the priests, and the kings of the house. As a prophet, every dad is a prophet. Each morning, your word is that saith the Lord. And as a priest, what a father does is to prepare an altar of worship and praise. You go on that altar always on behalf of your family. And if not every day, at least once a week, you must manage to bring your children before the altar. And you, the dad, you are the priest. And as the king of your family, you lead them by providing godly leadership and vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. The NIV of that same version, uh, translating the word vision is the word, is the uh, Hebrew word chazon. Says, the NIV says, where there is no revelation, where there is no chazon, the people cast off restraint. Nothing restrains them. The Good News Bible says, a nation without God's guidance is a nation without order. And the truth is that on the, in August 2011, what we saw in this nation was a nation without order. Why? Because we have become a nation without God's guidance. And when it comes to God's guidance, it is not the government. It is from the home. And when we, the parents, are not there to direct our children and tell them this is the path of the Lord and that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death, and we don't channel them on the right path. The path of righteousness, when they go wrong, it's not the government, it's us. The parents, no nation will rise above the strength of the fabric of its families. Is somebody with me? And the good news says, a nation without God's guidance is a nation without order. In other words, a nation where the parents do not take up their godly leadership, that nation will become a nation without order. And in August 2011, we saw it in this country. The Jerusalem Bible, translating that same verse, says, where there is no vision, the people get out of hand. And in August 2011, our young people went out of hand. They got out of hand. But you see, the sad thing that many of them forgot during the riots and looting was that Big Brother was watching. Big Brother was watching. How was he watching? If I say Big Brother, I mean government was watching. CCTV. And all the tests that they were sending out, they forgot that there is a server that, that how do you call that? They wrote it for me. Pylon. Which receives all those messages. Stores those messages. So, what Big Brother has done is to play back most of the CCTV 
go through some of these tests and the messages that were left, and our sons and daughters are gradually being put into prison. And you know what? It is so much they are still studying, they haven't finished. And the truth is that anyone who took part in that rioting, eh, if the CCTV captured them, the police will confront them. And at times, we forget to let our children know that in everything they do has a consequence. Sin has consequences. Teenage pregnancy has consequences. Rebellion, truancy from school, you end up with no certificate. Huh? You tell mom and dad you are going to school, you go somewhere, you end up with nothing. You don't do your homework. You won't get a good grade. So we should let our children know that everything that they do has a consequence. Rebellion. You rebel against your teacher. Ah. You rebel against the law of your land. You rebel against your boss. Oh, they will show you the door. Then Against the law, they will shut the door behind you and the door in front of you and keep you there. You are going nowhere. 24 hours, you have only one hour to go out for fresh air. Everything we do has consequences. But the Bible says that we should train up our children in the way that they should. And when they grow up, they will not depart from it. So what should parents do quickly? I believe that we should lead our families to put on the whole armor of God. This is our sure defense. Quickly turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at some verses there and I'll be ending the message with those words. Ephesians chapter 6, very powerful scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of weakness, wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore. He starts to explain the, 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 wep the weapons, the armor we should put on. Having gathered your ways with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery thus of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. You see, the apostle Paul was a master communicator, an excellent, uh, 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 an intelligent illustrator. And to bring his point home, he takes a Roman soldier to let the families understand and the churches understand that we are in a warfare and that the war that we are, fight, uh, we are warring in is not necessarily against individuals, but it is against nations, it is against families, then most importantly, also against us as individuals. So he takes a Roman soldier, if I can have the first uh, diagram, please, and, 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 and paints how in his day a Roman soldier dressed up. And with that in mind, he uses scripture to illustrate how a child of God to be able to overcome the enemy must put on the whole armor of God. You see, in the ancient times when the Roman soldier was going toward this, is how he dressed. And Paul uses this illustration to captivate the fact that to, to help us to understand that if we are going to win this warfare 
against the principalities and powers and spiritual weaknesses in the high places, if we are going to win that warfare, if our families will become champion children, if we will make a difference in our generation, then we must learn the secret of putting up the whole armor of God. Let me have the second diagram. So Paul goes on to explain how these weapons should be put on. And the Apostle Paul starts by saying that the first weapon we must put on is the belt of faith. Look at verse 16. Above all, taking, sorry, 14, stand therefore having gathered your ways with truth. The first weapon every child must put on is the belt of truth. It is not, I'm wearing a belt. We, the men, we wear belts. If not, we wear uh, 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 whatever they call it. But the truth is that the essence of wear, wearing a belt is that it will hold the trousers in position. Are you hearing me? And when a Roman soldier dressed, the tunic was so long and too loose. So what the belt did was to hold that dress tight together on the body. So Paul is telling us that spiritually, the weapon that holds us spiritually together and pulls all the spiritual loose ends together is the spiritual belt of truth. So in other words, we must teach our children by we taking the lead, helping them to live a life of integrity. We must let them understand that if your conscience is pure, and that everything that they do, they do, you do it out of a pure conscience. It does not matter how the devil will fight you, you will win. Oh, hey, it does, if you go into a marriage and your conscience is pure, no matter how poor you are, God will make a way for you. I'm not saying don't go and marry if you don't have a job. That's not what I'm saying. It does not matter what people will say about you. If your conscience is right, God will make a way for you. <laughs> Glory to God. A lie can make all things fall apart. Jesus says that very soon the prince of this world will be revealed. But when he comes, the prince of this world comes. But when he comes, he has nothing in me. In other words, Jesus will say, there's no lie in me. There is no darkness in me. So when the devil comes, he will have nothing to accuse me of. I pray that we will teach our children to love the truth that will teach them to speak the truth, and that will teach them to defend the truth in the name of Jesus. The, the, the second weapon Paul tells us to put on is the breastplate of righteousness. And what that breastplate did was to cover the tummy, the heart, and all the soft internal organs. You see, and spiritually, as a people of God, that breastplate plate of righteousness is the righteousness of God that has been imputed over us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. In other words, God took my sin, God took your sin, God took all the sins of the world and placed it on Jesus so that Jesus who had never sinned became sin. That was why God turned his eyes away from him, that through his death, he might destroy the power and the sting of sin. And when God did that, what God did was that he took the righteousness of Christ and he placed it on us. Praise the Lord. And that he did by grace. So we who in the past were sinners now have become the righteousness of Christ. So now when God looks at us, he does not see our sin, but he sees the righteousness of Christ over us. And it is so important that as a child of God, your righteousness, your stand in God must be so strong and so sure that you will understand that no matter the arrows the enemy will throw, in the night, it will not affect you. Listen, I was talking to a gentleman and he was explaining to me how he went to a place uh, and you know, still up to today in many, many third world countries here, uh, in this country, witchcraft is concealed. Here, witchcraft wears ties. 
but in many third world countries and high heels. But in many third world countries, witchcraft is very dirty. And he was sharing with me that with this particular ethnic people, what they do is that they take an arrow, real arrow, put it down, spit, chant on the arrow, and the arrow starts flying, and that is it. You don't find it again. It vanishes physically. And when that arrow is sent, it hits a target. The person that it has been sent to, in the spirit, the person all of a sudden suddenly gets a heart attack, falls down, and dies. Listen, Psalm 91, from verse 3 through 5, the Bible says, You will not be afraid of the arrow that flyeth by day, nor of the pestilence of the night. All what God was saying is that there are some arrows the enemy throws in the day. But as long as you are wearing that plate of righteousness, it does not matter what the devil will throw, it will not hit you in the name of Jesus. That is when a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand. With your eyes, you will see it, but it will not come now you because you are covered in the name of Jesus. That is why you must not toy with your salvation. Listen, if there is anything the devil fears about you, it is your righteousness in Christ. He knows that as long as you are a believer and you are living the Christian life, he has no authority over your life. That is why you must never be afraid of witchcraft in the name of Jesus. Every witchcraft authority over you is broken by the finger of God in the name of Jesus. So with that breastplate of righteousness, you are covered. Your heart is covered. No heart attack will come near you in the name of Jesus. Listen, but you need practical righteousness. Practical righteousness basically is a life of holiness, a life of humility, a life of goodness, and uh, fortifying your position in Christ. So when the enemy, you see, for many of you, your life is a no-go zone for the devil. And the devil knows. That is why to get you, he will first have to tempt you to slip out of your righteousness before he hits you. But when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just. And to reclothe you back immediately in the name of Jesus. There is, there, 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 there is no weapon that the enemy will fashion against you that shall stand in the name of Jesus. Your heart and feelings are protected from being seduced by sin in the name of Jesus. Because as a child of God, you've been accepted. Christ has accepted you. Not because of anything that you did, but because of his grace. Your life, you are significant. You are not ordinary. But importantly, your life is secure in him. But then Paul went on to explain the third armor of God, which is the shield Sorry, the third was a shoe of the gospel. He says, and having, verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shoe that the Roman soldier wore had nails beneath it, which made him, his grip on the ground become strong. You see, when Jesus said, it is finished, the wall, the petition that existed between us and God, the enmity that existed between you and God was broken so that now you and I have free access into the presence of God. The Bible makes it quite clear. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. You see, God is no longer angry with you. And it is a shoe that as a child of God, every day you must put on. You see, as a child of God, when you wake up from your bed, your breastplate must always be on. When you wake up, your shoes must always be on, and your helmet, I'll come to that, must always be on. But when you are going to fight, then you need a sword. And the truth about every child of God is that our feet must always be shod with the preparation of the peace of God. That means wherever we go, we share the gospel. Wherever we go, the aroma and the peace. As a child of God, what surrounds you is peace. You don't go to somewhere and there is confusion. No, because as a child of God, it is the aroma of Christ that is, uh, that is around you. And wherever you go, you leave the peace of Christ there. 
How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who spread the good news. Then Paul went on to talk about the shield of faith. The shield of faith is what the Roman soldier held. And, you know, he, and Paul says that with that, taking the, verse 16, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. In Paul's time, the Roman soldier, when he was going to war, the spear that he had, had a substance, it was dipped in a substance that was flammable. So when that substance, when the arrow was dipped into that substance, the next thing they did was to ignite it with fire, then they shot. So in those days, when an arrow was shot at you, not only would that arrow pierce your body, but it would also burn you. Are you hearing me? So Paul describes that as the fiery darts of the enemy. He uses exactly what was happening physically to explain spiritual principles. So when the enemy shoots an arrow, you take your shield of faith and you say, it is written. When he throws it, you say, it is written. When he throws it, you say, it is written. Remember that in the wilderness, when the devil tempted Christ, Jesus took that shield of faith and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When the devil told him to throw himself and that the God will give his angels charge over him. And when the devil told him to worship him, he threw, he, he held that shield of faith and said, it is written that him and him alone shall thou serve. Hallelujah. Then Paul went on to talk about the helmet of salvation. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is that which covered your head. The enemy's target is always your head. If you look at boxes, when they box, it's always a head. Because <laughs> once the enemy gets your head, not only will he confuse you, not only will he throw, disorganize you, he used that same method to deceive the devil, and it is the same method that the devil uses. But the good news, hallelujah, is that God has given us in the realm of the spirit a helmet. And that helmet protects our mind from the blasphemies, from the filthy things that the enemy tries to throw at us. So when, those, when the enemy tries to throw those things at you, you don't act them. <clears throat> because your mind is protected <clears throat> in the name of Jesus. You know that your salvation is secure. You know that because you've been saved by the Spirit, there is nothing that will hinder your salvation. Then the final armor he spoke about was the sword of the Spirit. And that was the only offensive weapon the Roman soldier had. And here Paul likens that to us in the realm of the spirit and says that God's word is the most powerful weapon that you and I have as children of God. Because God created the heavens and the earth by the spoken word. And God sustains the world by his word. And Hebrews 4.12, the Bible tells us that for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of man. Can I have the last picture? I pray that you, myself, and our families will always dress up this way. Understand that 2,000 years ago on the cross when Jesus said it is finished, he disarmed the devil of all the weapons he trusted in. But for you and I, the, warp, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And as a child of God, understand that you are armed spiritually by God in the name of Jesus. You see, you should never fear any witchcraft because the devil fears you. And this is how in the realm of the spirit you appear. The devil can hit your mind. You are protected by the helmet. The devil can hit your heart. You have a breastplate. Oh, is somebody with me? 
And when he tries to throw them hard at you, you have a shield. But most importantly, you have a sword. And if there is anything the devil fears about you, it is a child of God who knows who he is. And I pray that may every stronghold against your family fall in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of the Lord rest on your family in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of counsel come over you. May the spirit of wisdom and might overshadow your family in the name of Jesus. May the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord come over your family. May your children be taught of the Lord. May your children that are born and yet unborn, may their peace be of the Lord in the name of Jesus. Understand that your child shall be for a sign and a wonder in their generation. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we honor you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We pray that as a family, we will stand well armed, ready for battle, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. And as such, you have armed us and equipped us. And we know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but through you they are mighty to the pulling down of every stronghold of the enemy. May every stronghold against your people fall. May the Lord arise and may his enemies be scattered. In the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people shall say, Amen. Amen.